Hi, Booktube, and welcome to a new video. This is my Friday Reads on VE Day. Uh, two books completed this week uh, Anne Patchett's Bel Canto and Bertolt Brecht, his uh, collected short stories, uh, which represents uh, the sixth title I've read in the um, Read More German Literature 2020 uh, challenge. So I'm going to start with uh, the Anne Patchett Bel Canto, and I'm going to refer uh, to this book I read last week, Monique Roffey's House of Ashes, because they have exactly the same plots. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way, I just think it's very useful um, to talk about them because, you know, and compare and contrast. And the plots are, uh, there are terrorist organisations, uh, this is uh, set in an imaginary Caribbean island, but it's really Trinidad, and this is set in Peru. And uh, both terrorist groups mount an assault on uh, sort of presidential palaces, uh, or parliament in this case, and the vice president's palace in this case. Uh, they uh, end up in a standoff and a siege with the authorities outside. That's why they're exactly the same. But there's a world of difference in what is done within those long periods of standoff and nothing happening. This was very pedestrian. This was much more interesting how it was framed. So um, the premise of this is that uh, a Peru wants to attract uh, investment and they have been sort of badgering this sort of Japanese businessman to invest in their company to build factories and stuff. And he has shown no interest in it whatsoever. But basically they bribe him to come over at least by... Um, paying lots of money to get over the, a world-renowned opera singer, uh, knowing that this guy is very into opera. So they, they sort of throw him a birthday party in the vice president's palace, and the president is due to be there, but he cries off at the last moment for a very, very funny, but utterly believable reason, which I won't spoil. Uh, and the terrorists, they knew that the president was going to be there, and they've come in to basically capture him and hold him for ransom for their demands. And when they get there, they discover, of course, that the president is not there. And then the siege begins. Now, the two most interesting characters who are the catalysts, really, of, of, of everything that goes on here are the opera singer herself and a translator. Because this is a function about sort of investment, foreign investment stuff, there's lots of nationalities of guests are gathered uh, for this opera recital. And a lot of them can't speak to each other because they don't share a language, a common language. And obviously all the terrorists speak uh, Spanish. So the translator, who is the postal translator of the Japanese businessman, he's the only person who connect people within the room by translating what they say. And he's a very interesting character in, in you know, he's sort of both Japanese and as a translator. He's pondering his role, the difference between an I, subjective first person and a he a sort of invisible uh sort of uh facilitator third person and that and that constantly is is throughout is throughout the novel and of course the other the other sort of catalyst is the opera singer because initially uh are, you know once they're all under lockdown by the terrorists she begins to get concerned that if you don't try if she's not able to exercise her voice that she'll lose it and gradually she comes to basically find uh, someone who can accompany her on the piano. And she gives mo uh, morning and, and evening recitals. And she charms everybody, uh, you know, through this, the, 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 the sumptuous beauty of her voice and the power of her voice, even the sort of the generals of the terrorists. Uh, and the kids, you know, most of the terrorists are young kids, teenagers. And, and she basically casts this spell over everybody in the house. And... So we get a lot of interesting dialogues between people about, you know, what the beauty and power of her voice represent to them. So, for example, we get a Russian guy who uh, is a fan of opera and he declares his love for her, but not, not a sort of sexual partner love. It's just the love of what her voice represents to him. It's a, it's a soul love, I suppose. Uh, we get... Uh, a love of uh, a child, one of the, the child terrorists, who is so sort of struck by what she does that he sort of imitates her and is eventually heard singing in her style. And is a, he's a natural, you know, he, he has a natural gift for it and she takes him under her wing to sort of tutor him. So already you can see a lot of the, the, the barriers between prisoners and, and, uh, 
and jailers are breaking down. There's very much Stockholm system going on here, which is when you know the the, the prisoner sort of falls in love, or at least is is willing to come to the side of of, of the, the person who's taken them hostage. But it works both ways here. That's what's really interesting. That sort of prisoners fall in love with with their their you know their hostage takers, but also the hostage takers fall in love with the prisoners, particularly of course the uh, the opera singer. So. You know, these these terrorists have come out of the jungles. They haven't had much exposure to sort of civilization, particularly the kids. Uh, and all sorts of talents are sort of brought out by these sort of very privileged people. So one finds a, a uh, you know, he sort of sight learns chess and is a natural at chess. We had the boy who wants to be an opera singer. One of the uh, girls is, uh, you know, wants to be taught to read and write and has a natural proficiency for language. So, you know, had these kids grown up in other circumstances, i.e. the sons and daughters of the privileged in, in the palace, you know, these gifts could have been nurtured and, you know, they could have had full and rich lives. But, of course, the point of their struggle is that they didn't. They were on the wrong side of the tracks. And the opera singer... You know, another person she seduces is a priest. And again, you know, she uh, she seduces him not as a love object, except that her power and beauty of her voice to him reaffirm his faith in God, because only God could create such beauty in the world. So there's lots of really interesting stuff, unlike this, where people sort of talk to each other and have debates about politics. Here, it's much more about the soul and about art and about potential. And, you know, the politics is much more subtly fed in as these kids on the wrong side of the tracks. Had they have been on the right side, these gifts would have been, you know, nurtured. So infinitely better, better framed, I felt. And uh, another point is that the opera singer herself is half diva and half, you know, this, this almost demigod because of uh, her skills. But, you know, for all the power and resonance and volume of her voice, what she seeks also is quietitude, the silence, because it's obviously something she's never really been able to find. And she finds it with a guy, the Japanese guy, even though they, be, because they can't communicate with each other verbally, because neither speaks each other's tongue. And that, you know, they form a very, very deep bond through silence, and yet they're their soul merging is through opera. It's, again, a very, very ingenious sort of pairing. The only shortcoming I have for this book is that there are two love uh, relationships at the heart of it that develop, uh, which become sexual. And yes, I accept that in such extreme circumstances as a siege, your emotions go into some very strange places and you cling on to some strange bedfellows, literally. I didn't really buy either of those. One of them was a bit worrying because it's one of the the female terrorists who I got the feeling was 14 or 15 so uh, basically it's sort of statutory rape I, I don't know maybe I misinterpreted that maybe she was a bit older and she also seduces everyone in that room by her you know she's able to move about invisibly and silently but also she can you know, turn her hand to anything and sort of conquer everything she's the one who wants to learn languages and how to read you know how to read and write which she's never been taught and she came in painfully shy unable to utter even you know a sentence so she sort of flowers in the course of this thing and she's called Carmen and she does sort of seduce everyone uh as as per the opera um but you know is very much from from you know poverty background so there were those two central sexual relationships which I did not buy even though I understand the circumstances in which they could be formed I didn't I just didn't buy them with the characters that were paired together and then we have a four or five page epilogue at the end where there's a reconfiguration of a love and sex pairing um, after the siege. And I completely didn't buy that. I'm sorry. I mean, I can't talk about it in any great detail because it would sort of give things away, be spoilers. But it was absolutely preposterous to my mind that those two people would have got together having shown no real bond within the within the siege situation and just to say you know unlike this one in this book we had never really introduced to the forces outside you know the besiegers uh you know to, waiting for the siege to end 
Uh, they sort of shout things through the megaphones and eventually that, that goes quiet. So it's funny, I was trying to weigh up exactly how much of that is a metaphorical thing in the way that Albert Camus' uh, novel The Plague uh, is about a sort of um, a quarantine city called Oban in, in Algeria. Uh, uh, not Oban, Oran, Oran sorry. Uh, but the whole thing was a metaphor for the German Nazi occupation of France. So, although it talks about it in terms of, you know, plague and symptoms and, and quarantine and all this, that and the other, there was definitely a deep resonance. Uh, here, the state of siege, because it's never really talked about what's happening outside the building, it does sort of fade away into the background, and it reminded me of Louis Bunuel's film The Exterminating Angel, where there's a sort of bourgeois dinner party, and guests are gradually sort of dropping dead, but there's no there's no overt murderer. But equally, none of them can leave. None of them seem to have the the want to leave the room, that they or or, or the mansion. And this sort of felt like this because there's sort of no real sense of the threat outside the, the palace. It's almost as if none of the characters, be they terrorists or be they hostages, really wanted to leave. And a lot of the kids, you know, they're introduced to the luxury of the palace and they don't want to leave. They're quite happy for this state of siege to go on forever because it's, it's just fantastic living conditions for them. But it seems even the hostages are, you know, quite content to stay where they are because they have these gifts of hearing live opera from a world-renowned singer. So, you know, on the whole, apart from the romance, which I didn't buy, I thought this was a really, really good good novel and knocked this one into a cocked hat. And on to Bertolt Brecht's short stories. Um, this is has three translators. Uh, John Willett... Sorry, uh, no, those are the editors. It did have three translators. Yvonne Knapp... Sorry, Yvonne Cap. Hugh Rorison and Anthony Tatlow. And the stories have been collected and divided into three periods of Brecht's life. The first one, he was in Bavaria before he became known as a playwright. The second one, he was in Weimar, Berlin uh, from 1924 to 1933. And then the rest were in exile uh, when he was forced to flee by, by Hitler's ascension to power. And that's 1933 to 1948. And I had in my mind, you know, I read the first section of the Bavarian stories and they're, they're pretty dire. Uh, and I'll come back to why I felt that. So I had in my mind that, OK, well, it's when he gets to Berlin and he's sort of swept up in the sort of the cultural diversity and richness of what was going on in Berlin under the Weimar Republic. He also became known as a playwright with all his radical ideas on, on theatre, which are, you know, there really to... Uh, promulgate his sort of Marxist revolutionary beliefs. So I thought, OK, well, the Berlin section's got to be, you know, got to pick the, the, got to pick the pace up. And then in exile, how often is it that you find people, writers writing from exile about their, their home countries, just have so many sort of fascinating insights because they have that distance of exile. But not a bit of it. It wasn't like that at all. Oh, sorry, I should say Berthold himself is here to face the verdict. This is Bertolt Brecht. So the second part, the Berlin uh, section, um, had a surprising number of stories set in America or with American characters, as if Brecht was already there in his own mind, uh, even though at the beginning of his sojourn there in 1924, I don't think he could have been aware that he was going to end up in America as an exile. You know, no one could see the Nazis coming in 1924. Um... There's also the sense that Brecht, you know, the, the German movie industry had just sort of started and obviously he was very much playing second fiddle like every European movie industry to Americas, to Hollywood. So that, you know, Brecht maybe fancied being a film writer in, you know, uh, within the German system, but was taking as his model, you know, what Hollywood was producing. It's still the era of silent movies, by the way. So the Berlin section is, is equally disappointed to Bavaria. I will say it does contain the two strongest stories um, in, in the collection. The first is called Monster, in which uh, a Soviet film uh, crew are filming the story of, uh, a pog you know, of pogroms in, in you know, Tsarist Russia. And the main character is this sort of you know, terrible, you know, bloodthirsty guy. 
Uh, and the actor playing him is a little uncomfortable playing him because he's worried that, you know, he'll get sort of, you know, spat out in the streets for playing this horrible monster. But fortunately, wouldn't you know it, uh, a, a guy who wants to be an extra uh, is at the studio who looks exactly like this, this sort of bloodthirsty killer. So uh, they decide, well, you know, the, this is the proletariat. There's no, no such thing as specialised, you know, bourgeois, kulak uh, employment. So we'll give this guy a go. Uh, and, you know, he's not very good at it. And um, eventually the actor is inspired to come back and take over and do it properly. And I guess the ending, but it's still a good story. It's a nice, it's a nice twist on sort of the notion of, you know, representing things from history but with a political sort of overview you want to stamp on it uh and then the other story was of um the only one that i got a sense of sort of you know what's happening in berlin in that period where uh a guy is moving his family to berlin because you know it's the depression but he's been offered a job as a night watchman he dies on the journey and his wife sort of disguises herself as him because the family need the money so she sort of pretends to be a man and uh, shacks up with a woman, although it's not obviously clear whether it's sexual or not. But she's always afraid of being, um, of being, you know, revealed as a woman who, who's acting as a man. Uh, you know, this may be Weimar, but there's still, you know, certain sections of the public wouldn't, wouldn't buy the sort of cross-dressing impersonation of a man in real life and I thought that was a, that was a strong story but the only the only one in the Berlin section and then we come to the American section where you know half of the stories are sort of you know set in historical around historical figures there's one about Socrates there's one about the Thirty Years War there's one about a Roman general called Lucullus uh, there's one about um, Francis Bacon the English philosopher and they're you know they're the problem with this collection is Brecht's prose style is surprisingly flat. You know, given the sort of rambunctiousness and the audience participation and the direct addressing of his theatre, you know, there's none of that here. You know, these are really very sort of old-fashioned stories, very much sort of allegorical or parables. They're sub-Kafka, a lot of them, you know. There's a story in in the Berlin section which uh, a, a sort of a colonial is sort of invited to sit down while you know they uh, discuss uh, a murder and how the murder the guy accused of the murder is going to be led to his place of execution. Very much like in the penal colony, colony, and even without the metaphorical element of the whole you know device that puts to death prisoners in Kafka. Then there's another story about an sort of insurance fraud where this guy bumped into a guy, a beggar, who's at death's door through starvation. He sort of fattens him up through kindness initially, but then realises that there's an insurance scam to be had here. So he sort of periodically sort of, you know, leaves him, has him sort of starve, gets his insurance, uh, you know, swindles someone out of insurance and then fattens him up to do it again. And that read very much like Kafka's The Hunger Artist, although again, that it is a metaphorical component. Here it's just the straight tale of someone doing insurance fraud. So the whole notion of The Hunger Artist in Kafka, which was a meditation on, you know, food, uh, nourishment, uh, performance, uh, and being itself. There's none of that in, in, in the Brecht thing. The first story in Bavaria is of a bu you know, buccaneer's party off a pirate ship. They go raping and pillaging, which is very much both, I'm afraid, rape and pillage. You know, not a nice story at all. In another story in that section, this is how he describes people living in a, in a sort of um, apartment block. Usually he was skulking in the midst of a band of scrofulous children who were all too obviously the sad offspring of the scum of the earth. The whole blocks were out of children's piss. Well, Bertolf, you're supposed to be a man of the people. You know, you support the politics of liberating the proletariat. You seem very disdainful of the proletariat there. It's, you know, scrofulous scum of the earth. And equally, in, in the Berlin section, there are sort of hints at sort of economic and class uh, criticism but in a way you know Brecht's own stance within the authorial voices are just sort of a petty bourgeois 
you know, moral tusk tusk about it all. So this is a really, really poor collection. I will just briefly say that uh, at the end, uh, the, the, the story of Lucillus about a Roman general was an interesting meditation. You know, he's a man of war. He falls foul of, of sort of, of Roman politics. So although he's a great war leader, he sort of retires, you know, to the boonies to live out his life. Um, but he wants to be remembered for something. But he's scared if he sort of starts doing a PR job on his military victories and it will just bring a pro political opprobrium on him and it, he'll forf forfeit his life for it as he's shut up with a sword across his, his throat. But he wants to be remembered for something. And it's an, interest, it's an interesting meditation on a man who formerly wasn't scared of death, is now scared of dying and, and, and being forgotten, really. If he dies but he's remembered for something, then that's OK. So that, that was an interesting one. And I, I'm not sure, but I think it might have got developed into, a, into a, one of Brecht's plays. And then the other one is called the Augsburg Chalk Circle, which obviously foreshadows uh, the Caucasian Chalk Circle. Uh, but when you read it, you realise that it's just the sort of the wisdom of Solomon rip, rip off. You know, it's not terribly inventive. Now, the Caucasian Chalk Circle, I think, is a, is a, much, a much stronger play. Than, than this little sort of short story but there you have it you know this collect you know Brecht I absolutely you know venerate Brecht for his theatre the ideas what you know the relationship of audience to, to author or playwright in that case and the relationship of actors to the audience you know so important to my personal thoughts on being an author and being a writer and yet here there's none of that inventiveness there's none of that radicalism even it's just a it's almost mealy mouthed, uh, so really, really disappointing. So I give this two point five stars. I only give it two point five stars because the Lucilla story and the monster story, and to some extent the one about uh, the woman having to dress up as a man to get a job. I thought those three were good short stories, but the rest were were dreadful. So sorry to be the bearer of bad news, Bertold. I do still have his Thrupney uh, novel to read. Uh, this year as part of really more German lit. Uh, his prose style is so turgid, uh, but we know it's a great musical, uh, theater, piece of musical theatre, so I'm going to have to decide, you know, whether I can brave it or not, given just you know, how turgid this prose was. So uh, that's it, BookTube, for another week. Thanks very much. Till next time.